Good afternoon and a good Wednesday to you. I hope that you're having a good week. If you would, please look at Psalm 46 for our Bible study tonight. Psalm 46, which famously begins, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. There is a lot of trouble in the world today. We are constantly reminded of it, and I hope this week's midweek lesson will bring some encouragement and hopefully some stability to your life as we look at Psalm 46, a psalm of stability. I am a gadget and technology guy, and I don't always get it right. Sometimes frustrating uh, when you don't get it right, when everything doesn't work the way that it's supposed to. There is a lot that I don't know, and like most every pastor, we instantly became TV preachers overnight back in March. There are a lot of things that I want to do better, and so we develop these things as we go. We get the technology that we need. We figure out how to use it, but since I was a little kid, I was always fascinated by technology and um, art and music and how do we consume these things? How do we do it better? One of the things that I've got here, this is... Uh, I thought about this. We say that sometimes we're going to go film our message for Sunday. Well, we're not using film. We haven't used film in like 20 years. This is my first real camera that I got a little over 20 years ago. And the film actually goes right there in the back. And so you had 24 or 36 pictures before you had to stop and change it out. Kids today with their iPhones don't realize how good they have it. But this was great technology for its time. Uh, two generations before... And I'm hefting because this thing weighs a little over 10 pounds at least. This is some World War II photographic technology. And so you might think that this is a camera, but it's actually part of a camera. This is a World War II relic. It's still got service tags on it where it went into the shop in 1947. This was used in World War II for reconnaissance airplanes. And so what you're looking at here, if you look very closely, that is a timer on top. And that would tell the camera how often to take photos. You could take them everywhere from uh, intervals of seconds all the way up to 10, 20, 30 seconds. Really cool, neat piece of technology. Now the timer is just integrated to whatever we're doing with the camera. I'm fascinated by these things. One of the things that I would love to have right now, I just don't need it and I can't justify a few hundred bucks for it, it's called a gimbal. And a gimbal is not really necessary for still photography, but if you shoot much video, maybe you've heard of a gimbal head for a camera. So basically what it does, and I have a hard time explaining something if I don't fully understand it. So I'm not gonna tell you exactly how a gimbal works because I don't know. I think it may be its magic. So on a gimbal head, it allows the camera to rotate and swing on an axis while still staying focused on whatever is in front of it. It's an amazing thing. There is a computerized stabilizer in it that allows the camera to swivel and pivot but still stay smooth. So if you've seen like drone footage that's incredibly smooth even though the drone itself is pitching in the air, that's how this works. An amazing way that this comes into our lives was yesterday there was a huge explosion in Beirut. There are, I think, 300,000 people right now displaced in Beirut due to this explosion. As of this recording, about 135 deaths as this warehouse exploded in a populated part of Lebanon. There was, at that time, a man who was filming a wedding. He was doing a bridal shoot. And as he was panning and focusing on this beautiful bride, this blast hits in the middle of that. You see the blast come, the man runs, and then he runs back to follow to get to a safer place. That whole time, the image was smooth as he was filming. That is a gimbal in motion. So the work of a gimbal is to provide stability in a moving image, even though everything else is moving. If you're on stable ground, you don't really need one. You could handhold, a tripod would work, but what the beauty of a gimbal is, is that it provides stability even in the face of great movement. Psalm 46 is kind of like that. Psalm 46 is a gimbal psalm, if you want to call it that. How do we find stability in a world that is always changing and moving around us? So we've got to assume or to do a little bit of guesswork if we're going to understand exactly where and when Psalm 46 was written. Unlike some psalms, we don't have the exact setting of it. I love the psalms when it says, a song of David when X, Y, or Z was happening. We don't have that in Psalm 46. It just simply says, to the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. So there is some information there, but it's not specific about the setting. Here's what a lot of scholars believe, and I can't prove this, but a lot of circumstantial evidence makes sense that this was the setting under which Psalm 46 took place. In about 700 BC, King Sennacherib of Assyria was on the rampage. He had already conquered Babylon, destroyed it. 
He built a 30-mile canal to supply water to Nineveh. He had enriched himself. He had enlarged his borders. He was safe. Uh, he was expanding territory. He was conquering. He was aggressive, built himself a huge palace, and he's on the warpath. So they've already attacked Israel. The northern tribes have been successful there. Now they've already attacked some fortified cities in the south, and they are headed for Jerusalem. This is a terrifying situation for the residents of Jerusalem. Now they are within striking distance. And so the picture here, if that is the setting like we understand that it is in Psalm 46, the idea here is not necessarily some new thing on the horizon. It's something that you know how dangerous it is. It's a problem that's already been around. You have seen this thing attack other people, and now it is at the gates of your own city. This is terrifying. Maybe you've already seen the destructive power of it in your own life, and now there's a relapse. Whatever it is, this is not some unknown new novel thing. This is a known disaster that is right here. This is a terrifying situation. You know why you're freaking out, and you know the nature of the enemy that's at your gate. That is most likely the background of Psalm 46. So the king of Assyria at that time was Sennacherib. The king of Israel at this time, or the king of Judah, where this takes place in the south, was Hezekiah. And he is well understood to be a good king. He's a good king. He makes good decisions, and he listens to good people. He had some really good prophets there that were there with him. He's got Micah there with him. He's got Isaiah there with him. And instead of listening to the fear of the people, instead of listening to the taunts of Sennacherib, instead of listening to his own internal fear, he does exactly what he's supposed to do. And he listens to these prophets who are accurately speaking on behalf of God. He does the right thing. And so Hezekiah does the right thing, which is also the difficult thing, to believe the right things, to keep your head even in the face of such imminent disaster. He, had, he does the right thing. He thinks and he keeps his wits about him. So it's an age-old problem. Are you going to listen to the voices around you? Or are you going to listen to the voice of God? Or are you going to listen to your problems or the God who loves you? To listen to the God who loves you means to take an accurate assessment of the problems that are there, but to realize the greater reality is the kingdom plan that God has in place. Now, here's how this worked. And this is what Hezekiah would have known from the prophets was that even though this enemy seemed so bad, this was the plan that God gave him. God told him that Sennacherib was going to be called back home, but things got even worse. Sennacherib sends this awful, threatening letter, and in this amazing moment of, of humility, Hezekiah goes and he literally lays this letter out before God. It's in 2 Kings 19. And then this amazing act of deliverance comes, and the angel of the Lord, not the armies of Judah, but the angel of the Lord attacked Sennacherib's army and killed 185,000 of them in this amazing night of deliverance. Many scholars believe that Psalm 46 is the thanksgiving song that comes after that great deliverance. So verse 1, first three verses here, and we've got to figure out how to break this up somewhere. So this is a psalm. It's also a song. There are three verses here, and there is a phrase that repeats itself, or a word, that it, at each of these groupings, as we've divided this into three verses, at the end of each verse, as we call it, there is a word, selah, and it means to stop, pause, to reflect, to consider. So that gives us a division in our text. So the first one that we look at, keeping your stability when mountains fall, in Psalm 46 and verse 1. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble, and therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, even though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, and though the mountains shake with its dwelling. Selah, or stop and pause. I believe it was Dr. David Jeremiah who pointed out in, in his sermon uh, or his writing from this psalm that there are two very important attributes of God that we see in this text. And the first one is that, that God is accessible and again, this is one of the most famous verses from all the Psalms. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. D David Jeremiah notes here that God is accessible. He is close. He is not far off and distant. He is near to us. And second, God is ageless. He is accessible, but he's also ageless. And there's this repetition of thought that runs through Psalm 46, and it is the changeable nature of the world that we see. 
the changeable nature of the powers that be, even the mountains themselves, which look so permanent to us, and they are when compared to our own lifetime of 80 to 100 years. The mountains do seem permanent, but in the timeline of God, they are temporary. But God is ageless. Look at the, the change that's here, even in this, this first section. This first section here that we see that even though the mountains fall, that God is stable and in him we find our stability. In the first three verses, look at verse 2. The earth gives way, the mountains be moved. In verse 3, the waters roar and foam, the mountains tremble. All of this change, the sea that surges, the mountains that fall and tremble and quake, the ground underneath our feet does not seem stable. And even though the army of the Syrians looked so strong, they looked like a mountain. But God was more powerful. And as Hezekiah comes and he lays this threatening letter out to God, and he, he falls before God in humility and lays out his case of how, how powerless they are before them. In 1815, the poet Byron, taking his cue from what goes on in Second Kings and the attack of Sennacherib and his army, Byron wrote, writes this poem about the fall of the Assyrian army at the angel of the Lord. And I want to read this. It's, it's a little bit lengthy, but it's beautiful. And the cadence of this and the poetry and the imagery of it from what Byron said. And this is sort of a historical, poetical take on what's going on in Psalm 46 from Byron. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. And the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. Like the leaves of the forest when summer is green, that host with their banners at sunset were seen. Like the leaves of the forest when autumn hath blown, that host on the morrow lay withered and strown. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed. And the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill, and their hearts but once heaved and forever grew still. And there lay the steed with his nostrils all wide, but through it there rolled not the breath of his pride, and the foam of his gasping lay white on the turf, as cold as the spray of the rock-beating surf. And there lay the rider, distorted and pale, with the dew on his brow and the rust on his mail, and the tents were all silent, the banners alone, the lances unlifted, the trumpet unblown. And the widows of Asher were loud in their wail, all the idols broke in the temple of Baal, and the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. Byron, with that poetic take on what the angel of the Lord did here to deliver Hezekiah's nation from this attack. There's a built-in difficulty with these psalms, and, and that's maybe sort of a, a different and a difficult way to say it, but just go with me here. There is a built-in difficulty to psalms like this. There's a built-in difficulty to these wonderful Old Testament victories that God brought to his people because here's what happened. The people would cry out to God because a danger was there. God would answer and deliver them. And so we look at this and we say, well, that's how it's going to work for us, right? All we have to do is cry out to God and God will kill all of our Assyrians. It was so clear to Hezekiah how this was going to work. It even told him the troop movements that that God was going to take care of everything, and God did exactly what God said he would do. But in the absence of that, in the absence of this, this promise of deliverance and the specificity from God about our physical victory, what do we do? Well, we have something better. The New Testament calls us to a higher level of faith because our faith is not always so distinctly tied to what happens to our bodies. That has been detached somewhat. Our spiritual life does have a bearing on the physical, but our lives are about so much more than what happens to our bodies. So that applies here to the background of Psalm 46. The easy takeaway would to be this. Well, all I have to do is pray to God like Hezekiah, and whatever my Assyrians are, God will just wipe them out. All I have to do is pray, turn out the light, and when I wake up in the morning, I will find all of my interests solved. And that's not really how it works. That's not the reality of this covenant. So what do we do? We live in this age where our problems are not always as visible, nor are our victories. But we can have stability even inside of that. So the second verse, beginning in verse 4, what do we do when the earth melts? Stability when the earth melts. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God 
the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged and the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. Verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And again, Selah, pause, stop, arrest the musical notation. There's a pretty fantastic historical tie-in here that dates back to the time of Hezekiah. The psalmist mentions the river of God. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. So if you want to look at this in a physical aspect, Jerusalem at this time would have been the city of God. We understand that in a prophetic sense, there is a sense in which the city of God is still yet to be. But here at the time of Psalm 46, the city of God was Jerusalem. That's where the temple of God was and the religious life of the nation was focused there. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. So if we look at this and we think, okay, so what's the relevance to this? If you've got an Assyrian army camped outside to besiege them, what's the context of water? Well, obviously we're living in a very dry Middle East at this point. A city that was walled was very subject to being besieged because you run out of the most important thing for life itself is water. But what they had inside the, the walls was that you had a spring there and that you had a tunnel that was cut to it in this time. And it's called Siloam Tunnel or Hezekiah's Tunnel. We read about it in 2 Kings 20. It runs a third of, the mile, third of a mile underneath the city. And so you had the beginning of the spring, which welled up inside the city walls. But you also had, at the end of the pool of Siloam, this water disappeared and went underground again, so that it did not flow out of the city where it could enhance the operations of the enemy. It was a self-contained system that provided water for the people of God in the city of God and allowed them to withstand being besieged. And what a beautiful picture that in a time of being besieged by this horrible enemy, the people of God knew that they were going to have water because they had an ever-flowing well within them. And what a great picture of us in this new covenant that when you believe that when Christ comes to dwell within you, you have rivers of living water flowing from you. What an amazing thing. Streams of living water. If you have this source of life within you, then it doesn't really matter what happens on the outside. You are continually refreshed from within. Third verse. You are refreshed with stability, and you find your stability when you sit still. Look at verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 8. Come and behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and he cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And then verse 11 is a repeat. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Pause. Stop. Reflect. He brings peace. In this world of invading armies, in this world of old problems and new problems, in this world of avenging raiding armies, in this world of bad reports, we sit and we wait and we think. Look at verse 10. Be still. We are in a season where so much of life does not continue like it did before. In so many aspects of our lives, we are forced to a point of stillness. But just because our bodies are still, it does not mean that we are going to be still inside. We are so distracted, and it's so very easy to be anxious right now. And I love this, that if this is the case where the Assyrian army has been here, the call on God's people to simply be still, be still and sit and trust, be still and know. And that word is so important. There are so many things that we can't know, so many things that we may not ever understand in this life, but we can know that God is God. Be still, stop running, don't be afraid, don't panic, be still, and know that I am God. I was reminded in that, in that, that language, that terminology, surely to those readers it would have reminded them and brought them back to Exodus 14. And so the people have not been long out of Egypt. And so they come, and they are at their first major testing spot. Pharaoh begins to pursue them. He changed his mind about letting them go. 
So the Hebrews are out of the land, but they're not in the promised land. They are just steps into the wilderness, getting their first taste of freedom. And then they look behind them, and Pharaoh is pursuing them with the most powerful army in the world. Exodus 14 and verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. And they said, uh, they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. Verse 11, they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And Moses answered the people. This is Exodus 14 and 13. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. This is the wisdom of faith. Sometimes God called them to sit still. Sometimes God called them to be active participants and fight. And it took wisdom to know the difference. Just like it does for us today. It takes wisdom to know when do you speak up? When do you say something? When is it time to stand? When is it time to sit? Whatever we do must be done with the knowledge and the firm conviction that God is God. In the Old Covenant under the New Testament, when God wanted to deliver his people physically, he killed Egyptians and he killed Assyrians to liberate them physically. But under our covenant, when God wanted to liberate us spiritually, he didn't shed the blood of pagan armies. Christ, his son, shed his own blood for us. He gave himself to liberate us, not just liberate our, the illnesses of this body, not those, just those temporary victories, but eternally, eternally liberated. Nowhere is that more clear than in 1 Corinthians 15, in that great resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 53. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass that which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Knowing that we have victory, not just over these illnesses, but ultimate victory over death itself. Not just the individual things that bring death, but death itself as the final enemy. In verse 50, 58 of 1 Corinthians 15, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable. In other words, be gimbled. Be gimbled. Be stabilized. The thing about a gimbal is not just that it locks the camera down so that it can't move. The thing that's amazing about a gimbal is that it keeps everything focused as everything else moves. You don't need a gimbal if everything is stable. You need a gimbal when your hands are shaking. You need a gimbal when the bomb blasts during your wedding shoot. You need a gimbal when the Assyrians are at the gate. Be steadfast and immovable. I had friends who were almost seriously hurt this week when their side-by-side -side caught on fire on a trail with no warning. They had just enough seconds to get out of it before the whole thing was destroyed. My church member was with them, riding along with them, and he, had, he was prepared. He had a fire extinguisher. And the fire extinguisher, in the end, the people had already gotten out. The side-by-side -side was too far gone, but he was able, I think, to prevent a forest fire with that. And I got to thinking in the context of this that I've got a fire extinguisher on my side-by-side -side also, but it's on the back left corner, not the post that's nearest to my body where I could grab it. It's on the way back. So it's out of the way. But I also kind of thought it looked cool back there. And I thought about that in context of this. In Psalm 46, we understand that God is a present help in time of need. As David Jeremiah put it, one of the attributes of God is that he is accessible. He's accessible. He's near. 
but how often do we take advantage of the accessibility of God if we're not in a crisis? Most of us don't walk around with a fire extinguisher in our backpack or under our arm. We want it nearby, but not in the way. It's sort of what we've called before here at Memorial. It's spare tire theology. We want God in the trunk in case we need him. We don't want God clogging up the cabin. Sometimes I think there is a danger that we treat God as a spare tire, as a fire extinguisher. We want him there in our time of need, but that ever-present part, that's not really what we want. We don't want the ever-present God. We want the rescuing God. We want God, the spare tire, the fire extinguisher, ignoring him until our next crisis. Let us hold God close because he holds us close in Christ. Emmanuel, the name of Christ, Emmanuel is God with us. So as we wrap up today, I want to take you back to 1961. It was a little before my time. Some of you guys listening, you'll be you'll be locked into this. Ben E. King had a, an incredible hit song in 1961 called Stand By Me. And in that, he references Psalm 46. And here are here are Ben E. King's words. If the sky that we look upon should tumble and fall or the mountains should crumble to the sea, and that's part of American culture. That song has been redone over and over again. Benny King was, was inspired to write that song. And there are amazing distinctions. There are amazing uh, similarities between Ben E. Keith's song and an earlier song called Stand By Me Father, written by Sam Cooke. So if you go back and you, and you uh, if you're familiar with Stand By Me, and then you go back and you look up the lesser known Sam Cooke's song, Stand By Me Father, the, the similarity is amazing just in the musical flow of that song. But whereas Stand By Me was one of those songs that's just a great, a great love and friendship song that could be played on secular radio, listen to how spiritual this spiritual was by Sam Cooke. And this is what I want to conclude with tonight. Oh, Father, you've been my friend. And now that I'm in trouble, stand by me to the end. I want you to stand by, stand by. Well, of all my money... And all my friends are gone. God, I'm in a mean world. And I'm so alone. I need you, Jesus. Stand by. Stand by. And he goes on in the verses to talk about Samson and Daniel and the three Hebrew boys thrown in the fire. And he gets to the last verse. When I'm sick, Father, stand by. When the doctor walks away from my bedside, stand by me, Father. When it seems like I don't have a friend, I wonder, would you be my friend? Stand closer. Stand by. We can take such comfort in the fact that God came to be with us. Emmanuel, in Christ, God is with us. Let us take all the comfort and encouragement. Let us be stabilized. Let us be gimbled by the Spirit. When the bombs blast, when the doctors leave our bedside, let us be stabilized by the hope that we have in Christ. And I hope you can share that hope. May God bless you. We'll see you soon. Amen.